Jeremiah, welcome back to the show, man. It has been a minute, but it's always great to visit with you. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for uh, having me back on. It is my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, has California started to transgender your daughters yet? Uh, they're trying, trying hard. <laughs> we just got all the new things saying like possible mask mandates back for school starting in September. And we're like, what is going on? Like we put them in all these, you know, summer camps. We put them in all this other stuff. But it's like, oh, when you come back to school. So now people are getting back on that crazy bandwagon. So who knows? It's like they just won't let it end. How long can we beat this dead horse? Well, yeah. And it's funny because all the kids are getting sick during the summer, right? Because they're so, they get it for two days and they're good. We're like, well, then that gives them six months of immunity. So right. by the time school starts, it, I don't know. And all the teachers are like, we don't want it in our classrooms. So we'll see. At least we're in Orange County, which is very progressive. Mm -hmm. We're not as far back. Like, so you've got, we're, we're surrounded by LA County and San Diego County who are like, LA went back to mass mandates yesterday for indoor events and indoor like shopping and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and Orange County was like, enjoy yourself, have a good time. So we're mm -hmm. hoping that Orange County would be like, nah, screw it. So I, that we just wouldn't. I mean, if our governor tried to do that again, it, it would not go well in Texas. He wouldn't do it. I mean, it would be political suicide. Uh, well, yeah, but we have freaking Newsom who doesn't care about anything but himself and politics. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, again, that's why you and I are talking because we he just signs bills to make himself look good. And it's all and it and it all surrounds about him getting reelected and re put in and. He has so many people in his pocket. And he just ran some ads in Florida saying, hey, if you want, if you're tired of Florida trying to take your rights away, move to California. Did he really? <laughs> yeah, dude. He paid for ads to run in Florida. Uh, and the irony was him talking about, come to California for the freedom. What? No, we, we have, well, this is, the, this is the first time we've ever lost seats because of the amount of people that we've had in California. So many people have left California that we actually got seats taken away. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, we're sitting there going, how, okay, look at this. My buddy, uh, most of the kids I grew up with, most of the, most of the guys I grew up with there, they all left the state this last two years during COVID. And one of them moved to Michigan mm -hmm. and he tried to get a U-Haul, which is crazy, right? U-Haul tried to charge him $10,000 because they don't have any U-Hauls coming back into California. <laughs> so all the U-Hauls are leaving California. So he ended up buying a $49 plane ticket on Southwest, flew to Phoenix, Arizona, which is six hours away, got a U-Haul, drove it back to his house, loaded everything up to drive to Michigan because it, it, it still saved him like $9,000. All that wow. with gas and extra only cost him an extra $1,000. And he's like, yeah. screw it. And I'm like, you really going back and forth. And then so his little brother found that out, called U-Haul and said, hey, I'll drive the U-Haul back from Michigan to California if you pay me. Blah, blah, blah. They paid him to drive the U-Haul from Michigan back to California where his brother still lives down here. Mm -hmm. And his brother got like, I think like three grand from U-Haul to drive it back down to California because so many people are leaving. That's incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I, I did know that y'all had a negative population trend for the first time in history. Like so probably since the gold rush when people started going to California. I mean, it's oh, yeah. only grown. And more people left now than, than moved in. Well, the, and the reason people are leaving too is the fact that houses are so ridiculous, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Like a townhome, because I mean, I live in townhomes. A townhome right next to me, when I bought my townhomes, I bought them at $200,000, right, for a townhome. The one next to me just sold for $700,000 for yeah. a freaking two-bedroom, two-bath townhome with a two-car garage. And so they bought, you know, they could sell a $700,000 townhome turn around and go to Texas, go to Florida, go to anywhere else in the country besides the West coast and buy a six bedroom, six bath on 20 acres, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's California is certainly you're driving our, our housing market through the roof. Uh, like our house is worth more now than it was when we bought it by a significant amount. Um, but we got new neighbors from Chicago. They moved here because they didn't want to raise their boys in that kind of environment. And, you know, it's crazy. I, of course, I was joking about them, California, trying to transgender your kids. But it's that's the reality. And it's the sad reality that we even have these conversations. When you and I were kids, who would have thought we'd have been talking about this insanity? No, we'd be talking about what's going to be on Friday night TV show that our parents are letting us stay up till 9 o'clock. TGIF, baby. Get some Domino's pizza ordered. 
uh, that was the night my parents like would go out on a date. They'd be like, okay, y'all watch uh, what was it? Step by step and uh, family full, matters, and- family matters, full house, step by step. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's the same for us. Or it was like Friday night, we'd go to blockbuster for an hour mm-hmm. and look for, look for movies that we were going to watch for the next three days or rent the weekend. video game. Oh yeah. But the video games we rented didn't rot our brains out. Uh, like what they're, the smut that they sell kids today. And we'll talk more about that. Cause I think there's something to, to that. Um, so you did talk well, real, real quick. You did talk about transgender. They tried to give our kids a survey. I don't know if I told you this in class mm-hmm. Did I talk to you about this already. You told me, but so, we haven't. Mentioned yeah, so, show, so, so the last, uh, the last week of class, they, they gave our kids in junior high and elementary school surveys, like take this and tell us about yourself, you know, like mm-hmm. what's your favorite color. And then all of a sudden they're like, do you identify it as another gender from what you normally are? Do you find girls or boys more attractive? Do you, this is what How they're old are your daughters? Eight and 12. Why should they ever be subjected to those questions? They shouldn't. Ever. It's, it's a force. And there's so many people got angry. Like I told my kids, I'm like, don't, because when I started hearing other parents, talk about it, I'm like, don't fill it out. Mm-hmm. My kids looked at it like, no, thank you. They're like, oh, you, they're like, no, thank you. And it's, but you're, you're having, you're exposing these kids to this, thought process of, Hey, you're 12 years old. You're starting puberty. Do you find, of course, my daughter's going to hang out with girls more than boys. Cause she's embarrassed by boys and she's embarrassed about her growing body. Mm-hmm. And she's in, so it's come more comfortable to hang out with her best friend that she's been since kindergarten. And so now all of a sudden you're like, well, since you like to hang out with girls more then you're a lesbian. And if you, or maybe you're a boy or maybe you're a boy because you like girls. And so and it's, it's just insane that there's this thought process that goes into a school board in California saying this is okay to hand your kid mm-hmm. and not even, you know, send it to the parents, whatever. I don't really care. I'll just throw it away. But they're giving it to our kids without our knowledge and having our kids fill this crap out. And I don't think California views them as your kids, dude. That's the oh, no. They view they them as voters. Them. Yeah. They're their kids to yeah. indoctrinate how they see fit. And there, I mean, that. I think everything that's bad, and obviously this doesn't have anything to do with, with hunting, but, um, but you can connect the dots. 99% of anti-hunting legislation came from the same school of thought as this kind of BS. And it starts in the West and East Coasts, and it just kind of bleeds into middle America slowly, slowly, slowly. But it gets here, and we see it in Texas. You know, um, And I, and I want to say this because I think it's important. They don't, parents don't realize that their school boards have been taken over by liberals. That's the problem. 100%. And, and no one knows because you, you live in a place where you're, you don't think these things could, could ever happen. And then you wake up and it's like, wait a second, 80% of us disagree with you. 90% of us disagree with you, but, but, they, but, but they control the whole school board. So it's their indoctrination. It's their agenda that they're pushing on you. And, you, and it's happening before you even realize that the, you know. So my message would be, get involved with your local school board. I'm starting to take notice of that and um, going to start going to the meetings for sure. Yeah. And it's even for the fact of, you know, they, they took religion out of schools, right? We're not allowed to, our kids can't take Bibles to school. They can't pray mm-hmm. at school. Like my daughter prays at lunch. And I remember one of the teachers one time was like, Hey, you know, keep that to yourself. But in junior high, they were in their, um, their English studies class that one of their teachers was doing. They brought in a Buddhist monk to talk to the kids about Buddhism and meditation. Yeah. It's religion my, though. My daughter comes home. She tells me about it. And I went, mm, what happened to no religion in school? Well, Christianity is bad, but they literally, so I went to the teacher said, okay, I want to go in. I'm an ordained pastor. I want to go in and talk to the kids about Christianity and faith. They're like, mm, we can't do that. And I was like, you just did a Buddhist monk. Like I'm the same. Oh, and they're like, dude. and it wasn't the teacher's fault. It was, what she was taught to do and what she was told to do and what she was, but yeah, they can, they can have a Buddhist monk go in and talk to our kids about Buddhism, but they can't have me, a white male with a beard, go in and talk about Christianity. Well, that's because you're the most toxic uh, specimen of the human race these days. So uh, unless, uh, unless I identified as a woman, then I would be voted in celebrate her. They might even yeah. nominate you for uh, NCAA woman a woman of the year. Come on. My comment was pretty, was yeah, pretty was good awesome. <laughs> now, for anyone that's not aware the, the the transgender swimmer at penn university uh, leah thomas who sucked so bad at swimming with real men that she had to go kick all the women's ass in the pool 
she's been nominated. Well, it's a he because it has a penis. It's not a woman. Uh, but it's been nominated for Woman of the Year. What a slap in the face to feminism, dude. <laughs> like, And if, you know that they told her teammates, his teammates, that they couldn't publicly comment because they weren't happy about it. And this guy with a wiener was showering in the same locker room with them. They were told they couldn't speak out about how that makes them uncomfortable. None of the women that, that he was competing against were okay with it. None of them. Well, just look at that picture where they're all standing on one side and he's over, but that's just, mm -hmm. that's just what it means. And, and even for the fact, like, I mean, I have daughters, you have daughters. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine in junior high, if all of a sudden there was a boy going into shower and change before PE with my daughter, I would be I'd lose my F in mind. Yeah. And Biden's trying to push that like legally right now, this week, he is trying to protect the rights of the gross minority of kids that they've indoctrinated that want to be, you know, I'm, I'm a girl now and I'm going to shower with the girls, even though I'm a wiener, he's trying to put their, uh, their safe space above the safe space of, of in the sanctity of a bathroom for adolescent girls. It's absurd. And no offense. I've been an adolescent boy and I don't care what you identify as your, your mind is still driven by one thing only. Mm. And that's it. And even if it is a different gender, you still, but those girls are going through that same awkward period that that boy is or that whatever they want to be called. They, them, it, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, it's just, it's, it's scary. And it's, it's one of those things that as a parent, you look at going, man, how, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. Especially in California, because they're like, just do whatever to make a kid happy. I, I have a nine-year-old son too. And yeah. guess what? Henry doesn't shower with his sisters and their family. My sister or my 12 year old and eight year old don't shower together. Yeah. There are different it's, stages. Uh, there are different, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not when they're two years old and in the bath anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, it's insanity. Um, when are you moving to Texas? You spend enough time hunting and, and stuff here already. Dude, you're, you're, it's, it's my wife that I'm waiting mm -hmm. on. Um, no, we're actually, I was looking at tons of property in Texas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and my dad's retiring. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to buy the property, have him live on there, start to develop what I want to develop. And then when, when my wife retires in a couple of years, I'm out. Um, mm -hmm. Because her retirement, it's just, she works for government. So if you leave, you lose, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Um, all right. Well, so that's why you guys are stuck there for the uh, immediate future anyway. Just a couple of years is what it looks like. So cool. Cool. You, I mean, how many times a year do you come to Texas? At least once or twice. Oh, but I think last year was eight. Really? Yeah. I've yeah. already got, I think I already have like five planned for this fall. Mm. So. Um. We'll talk more about that, but I do want to talk about, you sent me this thing, uh, this link to this new bill in California, and it's Assembly Bill 2571, and it's a gun control bill. Uh, it's the Advertising Firearms to Minors bill. I, I read it, but if you want to break it down for us, um, I don't know how much you, you, you looked into it, but, um, no, I, I dove into it crazy because it impacts me directly, even though they say it doesn't impact me directly. Uh -huh. Um, so this bill, pretty much what it's saying is that we in the state of California, you're not allowed to market or share pictures or content of any kind that has kids involved, or that could lead to kids getting involved in firearms or firearm safety. And if you read the actual things, it talks about even clothing, hats, gear. So if my daughters are wearing a Remington t-shirt or a Mossberg t-shirt, because they're one mm -hmm. of my sponsors, legally, I could get fined $25,000 because they're one of my sponsors. Therefore, I work for a company mm -hmm. who is involved directly with a firearm law. Now this is also, if you read the bill towards the end, it also says also includes ammo. So think about all the different ammo companies, gun companies, Moss, you know, Mossy Oak, they have different firearms that they have backed and different, you know, their camel patterns are on stuff. So all that falls into this law that was signed in. And if you look at who signed it, it was, it was literally signed in as an emergency act by six Democrats who said this is what we have to do. And then Newsom signed it and it's actually went into effect July 1st. And it's crazy because 
for me, I'm like, okay, this really impacts me because I can't post pictures of my own kids on social media. I can't talk about this to kids. I can't. And then I started talking to a lot of my buddies who are part of Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, who are part of the DNR, who are part of NWTF who work in California, who are Ducks Unlimited who work in California, California waterfowlers, you name it, you know, um, the organizations that are here that you guys all have in Texas. A lot of our stuff is geared towards families, is geared towards kids. And so I got a message uh, from one of my buddies who is one of the co-guys in NWTF for Southern California. And he wrote that he was actually contacted by National Wild Turkey Federation, said he, until further notice, he is not allowed to have any Jake's events in the state of California or attend any shooting events. Like we have, we have a place down here called Rahagi's. Mm -hmm. And every year we do a, um, what's called like a youth day. We bring kids in. We teach them about firearm safety, about dog handling. We uh, there's like 30 different dogs there. Um, kids can fish for free, shoot for free. They can. It's all. It's all done by volunteers, and it's ridiculous. It's, it's absolutely amazing. But we're not, he's not even allowed to be a part of that. He's not allowed to go to that just by working with NWTF. Oh, wow. And they're not even allowed to post pictures. So then I talked to a buddy who does all the youth programs in the state of California for Department of Fish and Wildlife, and. They're fighting the bill. I talked to him last night because I knew he was going to be on here with you. And they're fighting the bill. And he said they're trying to, he's trying to get, it says, um, we're trying to get an exemption for hunting coming that's supposed to be included in the next write-up. So currently right now, hunting is included in that. We're not allowed to have any youth events. We're not allowed to share any youth events. We're not allowed to even share an event that youth could go to, or you can be penalized up to $25,000 per Instant fraction. Yeah. 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 So, so let me ask you this from a manufacturer standpoint, because I also interpreted it when, when I read it, that they're not allowed to market like Mossberg can't run a commercial or put Correct. up a, uh, a, a, a banner or something like that. Even, um, even at Bass Pro Shop. So like we have Bass Pro Shop, mm -hmm. they can't put up anything that would market towards kids. So well, how do you define what would market towards kids? I would say any advertising whatsoever would market towards anyone that sees it. Exactly. That's the, 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 the same. They, were, they tried to introduce a law um, three years ago that said that there would be no hunting within fences in the state of mm -hmm. California. The problem is, is that you have a, a property, say you have 60,000 acres. Your neighbors have a fence on the front, back, and sides. It is now a three-fenced property, which you're not allowed to hunt on. Even though you don't technically have a fence on your property, it's not a high fence, it's not, but it's a fenced in property. So even though it's 60,000 acres and one, it, one, it, one side backs up to National Forest, because it's gated, it's, you know, fenced on three sides, therefore you're not allowed to hunt it. The bill didn't pass, but that's- But that's they, not even fenced. If there's not a fence no. on one side, it's not-, it's not this, is the way, but this is the way that California tries to <laughs> manipulate the system is, is they write, if, if you go read this article, you can type it in. I bet Cable will put a link- but it is very, very misleading. It's very hard to read. There's a bunch of just big words that repeat themselves over and over and over again. It sounds it's like we, Kamala. Oh, yeah. And we sat there and dissected and dissected. Like what, it. what did you just say? What is that? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> and the biggest thing is, like, my wife was the one that was like, well, what, is it, what does it do for you? How does it impact you? And the biggest thing is, it's because um, there's what, I can't even tell how many sections it is. But the biggest thing is marketing to minors. So it says the fire industry member shall not advertise market or arrange for placement of any advertisement or marketing communication concerning any firearm related product, including am ammo in the matter that is designed, intended, or reasonably appears to be attractive to a minor. You're wearing a Vortex shirt. Is that a violation? That's a... If my kid was, yes. Oh, huh. okay. But the, the wording says attracted to a minor. You have a nine-year-old boy. He walks into Bass Pro Shop. Everything is attractive to him. Oh, he wants it all. Yeah. Even, all the, even the candy by the, by, by the exit aisle, mm -hmm. it's still attractive to him. And so if you think about this in the state of California, it's going to shut down a lot and it's going to impact everything just for the fact that people are now afraid to do things. They're afraid to put stuff out. Like I even, we went to Bass Pro um, just the other day and they already had, like all the advertisements gone. Like there was no posters, there was no billboards, there was no, it was like everything that got taken down was taken down because some crazy walks in there and looks at it and it's going to be 
a million dollar fine of all the advertisements they have up on the walls. Oh my gosh, dude. But yet here, so here, how does, how do they justify? Cause I guarantee you they're not going to do this. They're not going to tell grand theft auto 35 or halo or, um, gears of war. What are these other stupid video games? Call of duty. The big one. I think kids playing Fortnite. even there, the people shoot each other on there all the time. That's right. the premise of these games. Uh, but on Grand Theft Auto, you can also like bang hookers and stuff like that, which I'm really uplifting wild, for man. kids. Yeah. Uh, but are they going to stop? Are they going to say that these companies can't advertise those and put those commercials on TV? No, because they're not a firearm or firearm related company. What's re- more pervasive, more perverse for a child's mind? Besides trying to be indoctrinated and told them, you know, that they're, they might be a boy trapped in a girl's body. These games where people are getting shot all the time or you know, going hunting with their dad. Oh, hundred percent. The answer. Yeah, it's a rhetorical question, but this is the mindset of these idiots. And also, I think about Hollywood, and th- just look, watch any movie trailer. I guarantee you, on an action uh, film, you're going to see gun violence just on the trailer itself. I mean, that sells the like gun sell, and they're going to let Hollywood continue to run rampant and do what they've always done, which is promote gun violence. And I don't care. I mean, I don't mind seeing that stuff, but I'm 40 years old. I'm an adult and I'm a mentally fit adult. I can handle it. You're putting that stuff in front of kids and then you, and you're in the same, you know, same thing as the video games and then telling them that they going hunting with dad and, and advertisement for a Jake's event of trying right. to enroll future conservationists into our fraternity of hunters is bad for them. Right. Or we have, it's, <laughs> and it's, it's insane just for this, this mentality that you're talking about. I mean, I posted a while ago during COVID, I went to the grocery store and I had on a black rifle shirt. Remember mm-hmm. the story? And it had a picture of a uh, AR-15 on the front that said like black rifle coffee. Mm-hmm. He sent it to me. I was wearing it. Had, didn't, even, didn't even remember that I put it on in the morning. So the aspect of it, I go to the grocery store and I'm walking to the grocery store and this lady starts yelling at me. How dare you wear a shirt with an, a, with, 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 with an automatic rifle on it? How dare? And I'm like, what is this lady? She, oh, she's yelling at me. I look down I'm like, oh crap. Okay, mm-hmm. whatever. And she has a like a, a 10 year old, 11 year old boy with her. And she's, I ignore her. I start walking down another aisle. She's yelling and screaming at me, you know, pulls out her cell phone, yelling and screaming at me. And I turn around, I'm like, ma'am, just, it's just a t-shirt. Oh, that t-shirt. It's going to tell my kid that gun, that gun violence is okay. It's going to show my kid that this, and she starts going off on, it's going to, how it's going to destroy her kid by my, my freaking t-shirt I have on. And she's going, going, going. I look at the little kid and I said, Hey, you like video games? She's like, don't talk to my kid. The kid's like, oh, I love video games. I'm like, what, what video game do you play? He's like, oh, I play Call of Duty. I'm like, oh, awesome, dude. What's your favorite gun in Call of Duty? He's like, oh, my favorite car, my, my, my favorite gun's the Scar, and it's this, and it's that, and it's this. And it's, I was like, oh, yeah. I go, what's your, he was like, oh, yeah. And then I try to get sniper headshots and da 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 And I looked at the, the mom and I said, that right there is screwing up your kid more than my T-shirt. Your kid just got more excited about a sniper gun that has a, someone in the head. Yeah. That is getting headshots and he gets more points for headshots with, with, with a non-sniper style weapon, which is an, a scar isn't even, it's a three round burst. It's not even a fully automatic rifle. Right. And he's telling me all about the stuff and the mom just flips the F out on me, like in my face yelling, don't tell me how to parent. If my kid wants to play video games, he can play video games. You know, Bob, it's just a video game. It's not real life. Your it's shirt just is just a t-shirt. You dumb, but it was, what? but it was in real life. So as they were walking away, I looked at the sun. I said, Hey, by the way, my gamer tag is the wild chef. <laughs> Fun fact, that kid went and found me and asked to be my friend. I didn't play with him, but I was just like, okay, so this little punk head kid whose mom is crazy is like, Oh, I'm going to go play call of duty with this dude. Cause he knows what's up. And it was mm. crazy to think about this. Mom is just allowing this kid to go play these video games that he has no idea about. None. She has no idea. None. What she bought doing. it for him. Yeah. You know, it says MA 13 on it and he's 10 and she's buying it for this kid. And he's telling me all about these firearms and I'm wearing a, a t-shirt from a coffee company <laughs> and I'm the bad guy in this situation. Right. I'm the evil one in this situation. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I'm wearing this gun shirt. My, my, my kids own firearms. They're not allowed to play these video games. 
Yeah. You know, when these shootings go off and all this other stuff goes off, like we went out to uh, Henry's the nine and he has friends that are allowed to play Fortnite. He's not allowed to play at their houses. hundred percent. He has, and, he owns four guns. Well, they're, I mean, I own them, but I gave them to him. Oh, well, same. Yeah. But yeah. And, and didn't, didn't he go shoot his first deer too this year? Yeah. He's shot uh, a doe and a black buck doe and he shot uh, his first buck this year. So, right. Yeah. He's, uh, he's having some success and he loves it. But no, no, no first person shooter games for our family. I really think it's that desensitizing, even for the watch Disney Channel now with your kids. Every show has some sort of homosexual aspect to it or some so, sort of leftist agenda to it. Even like, you know, any new movie coming out, like that mm -hmm. new Buzz Lightyear movie. Yeah, we're not seeing that. Not no, I mean, I already told my kids you're not allowed to see it. And I don't know, it's, it's scary to look at. And I'm at. not even anti gay. I don't care. I could care less what you do. Uh, just don't force it down our throat right i could i could care less was, was there a gay joke in there homosexual don't care i'm the uncle to to a niece and nephew have two moms um, i'm pretty open-minded on that stuff i believe in live and let live right and i think a lot of conservatives do but then the other party the other side is like tolerance tolerance live and let live oh you disagree with me f you you've got an ar on your shirt what's wrong with you you murderer i mean that's the that's what we're dealing with <laughs> yeah no and it's scary i just saw someone sent me a video this morning and it was these two dudes on campus asking questions to other students at campus and this one crazy leftist kid comes in and he starts screaming and they're videoing them going oh he's calling campus security because we're asking questions mm. so he literally gets on the phone with campus security and he's telling them they're like what's the problem he's like well they're asking questions and they're trying to force their opinion on us and they're causing an uprival, you know, an uprising, and they're this and they're that. So the two campus police come and they're like, okay, well, what's the question? So they tell them, they're like, it's freedom of speech, dude. Well, yeah, but they're making me uncomfortable. And they're like, then walk away. He's like, well, the no, they're doing right this, there. they're doing that, they're doing this. And he's like, why are you, why can you have a voice and they can't have a voice? And the cop's like, unless you can tell me why they're breaking the law, they're free to stay. Well, they're making me feel uncomfortable. They're making an up. He goes, you're the only person screaming and yelling here. There's no one else even around you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this kid's videoing the whole time. And finally the cops, the cops end up shaking this dude's hand saying, Hey, have a great day. Great questions. And walk yeah. away. And this kid just loses his mind. And that's well, the society that we're raising is like, when, Hey, when we were kids, safe spaces didn't exist, dude. Everyone's coddled now. And everyone, even in my kids' sports, you lose, you still get a trophy. I'm like, no, we don't, we don't, we don't accept trophies for 10th place in this family. Yeah. Cupcakes are for winners. winners and losers in life. You want to be a winner? Work your ass off. You know? Yeah, my uh, one of the guys at church got mad because he was talking about letting his kids win in board games mm. because they lose too much. And my daughter goes, I don't think I've ever beat my dad in checkers or chess. And I said, and you won't until you actually beat me. And he's like, you don't let your kids win. I was like, hell no, I don't let my kids win. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't. My dad would kill me in all sports and all events until I actually beat him in it. And then he'd be like, Oh, good job. I'm never, I'm never playing checkers with you ever again. And you know, it's like, why would I let my kid beat me just to make them feel comfortable right. when they didn't, when they didn't actually do it. I remember the first time I beat my dad in a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball, I was 14 years old, 14. It, and it took me years and I probably didn't beat him again until I was 15, you know? Yeah. It took me years. To, my, my son is nine. He has not beaten me in basketball and he won't until he beats me. Right. Don't let him win. But that's the society we live in. And that's why I think this bill is so scary. It's because I posted it and a lot of people came at me who I know they're like, well, yeah, but it's good. It's sort of like the tobacco. And I said, okay, yeah, let's see how the tobacco industry is doing on not marketing to our kids mm -hmm. with all these fruity flavors and fun things that they're throwing in there. And there's more kids vaping and smoking now than there was when we were in high school. No, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm at I mean, you know, vaping doesn't even smell. Like, you don't even have to hide the scent from your parents. No, you just sit there and smoke a blueberry, and you're good to go. And it's, I'm like, okay, so we, we banned all that. How's that going? Oh, we also have, have really, in city of California, looking at alcohol laws. You know, look at those fun alcohol commercials that come on TV, where the party's going crazy, and everyone's having fun. They're taking shots, and then they're getting, they're hooking up, or they're whatever. And there's no... How's that working out for you? Mm. Tell me the last time you saw a gun commercial on TV. I, I don't think I ever have seen one on TV. Right. And even when we're watching videos and safety things, like 
if they're grown up around it, and I think that's the problem is you look at this. It wasn't on Sportsman or Outdoor Channel, you know. Yeah. Um, other than that, but yeah, just basic television. No, you're not going to see any gun or ammunition optics, even nothing. Well, and and kids nowadays they look at guns. At, well, like I said, for video games, and there's there's no outcome of it. My dad always said, in real life, there's no reset. These kids don't re- realize that. Is they're used to dying, coming back, dying, coming back, killing someone, them coming back. And there's this back and forth. And in real life, a gun is going to kill you. It, there's, there's damage to it. And I think our kids understand that concept because we're hunters and they've seen death and they've seen the power of a gun. Like we went out and we were shooting 22s in the desert and my daughter had some friends there and her friend went to grab for the gun. And my daughter said, stop. Again, she's 12 years old. She's like, this is the trigger, the trigger and the barrel always point. And she starts explaining the gun to this little girl. The girl gets on it. She goes, keep your finger off the trigger until you're down sight and you're right. That's something that we instilled with her. This little girl would have just got there and started just firing this gun around, not even thinking about it because she's used to playing video games. She's used to her parents, not control, you know, not teaching her the proper ways to do things. And us as parents, we're the evil ones because we teach our kids how to take care of guns. Mm. So, yeah, this gun safe behind me here. Um, my, Second, co- my cousin brought his kid over, and um, he w- he's 13. And I opened that gun safe up. He went to start grabbing everything, dude. He was so excited. He, and again, he plays a lot of video games. And he's just looking like, I'm, I'm like, my kid would never touch a oh. gun. Henry would, if I opened this up, Henry would wait for me to hand him the gun that I wanted him to have. This kid, whether it was a handgun, or I, I eventually looked at my cousin. I was like, John, tell him to chill out. You know, when I'm just showing you some things, we're not even like getting handsy with them. Okay. But yeah, it's a completely different mindset and I could leave a gun sitting on wherever in the house. And I have a handgun. My kid's never going to touch that gun ever. Yeah. We were in, we went camping and I brought a, uh, a shotgun and I set it down on unloaded everything, set it down on the, on the uh, couch when you walk in our trailer and my eight-year-old walks in looks at the gun, walks back and goes, dad, uh, is that gun safe and unloaded? I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, can you put it away, please? Mm. I was like, oh yeah, you got it. I walked in, put it in the cupboard. She's like, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the mindset that our kids have is the safety thing. I don't know if I ever told you the story. My daughter and her friend were at a park and they found a handgun. It was like last year and her friend picked it up. It was like, oh, look, a gun. And my daughter goes, put it down on the ground. My daughter walks over, pushes, pushes the, you know, mag eject and it goes out and she sits there and she goes, don't touch it. My daughter said there. She was like, you go get your mom. The mom came and the cop and my daughter's still standing over it. And the cop's like, Oh, what's going on? And she goes, well, I ejected it, but I didn't check and see if there's a round inside the chamber, sir. The cop's like, uh, well, you did a good job. And so then I found out later on when I got called by this mom and I'm praising my daughter, the mom's all upset. And I'm like, Hey, listen, your daughter could have killed my daughter. But my daughter had the balls enough to push the eject, stand there over it and saying, no one goes near this gun until there's an adult here. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's the mindset. And if that's we the mindset away, that kids used to have, that's know? what I had. Right. I would have never right. picked up a gun and flung it around and tried to shoot people. And it's just insane. Well, all we can do is, is raise them the right way and continue to fight the insanity that they're being um, <sighs> subjected to every day. Let's take a break. We'll come back and get into a little more lighthearted conversation on hunting and uh, some wild game recipes. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. <clears throat> Jeremiah, thanks for sticking around, man. Certainly yeah. enjoying the conversation. Um, first of all, what about, what are your, what are your Western plans? I know you're coming to Texas um, probably multiple times this fall, but what Western stuff do you have going on? Do you, yeah, like, to, I, you like to go hunt antelope? Oh yeah. I got, I, I drew for an antelope buck in Wyoming again this year. So, be heading out and everyone else in the party didn't get drawn. I was the only one that got drawn. <laughs> uh, so it's actually kind of exciting because every single year for the past 10 years, I've been taking five, six guys to go. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually like the last one to shoot. So this year, me and my dad are just going by ourselves. And uh, my buddy who is a guide there just had a, just had a brand new baby. So he's not guiding this year. So he's all excited. He's like, so I'm just going to go out with you guys. So he actually called me this morning. He's like, oh man, I saw this really funky buck and sent me a picture. One, one horns going out over his face. I'm like, keep an eye on that guy. Cause mm. I could care. I could care less about 
Boone Crockett. I want something that's ugly and funky. Uh And so, yeah, it's doing that. Um, I've got plans to, I drew um, a D12 tag here in California, which is a large desert area, but we've got all the desert mule deers that come up from Mexico, Mm. all the fall, the Colorado river. And so drew there. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Going to spend some time. Is that a hard tag to draw? It's not a hard, it's, it's a harder tag to draw. It's not like the X zones up by like mammoth and stuff, which are like, you need 30 preference points to draw those ones. Mm. Um, but it's, it's a hard area to hunt if you don't know what you're doing. And so a lot of guys put in for it and then it's the success rate is pretty low, but the area that I am going into, I'm going in with a buddy who's department fish and wildlife guy. Mm. We've been scouting it for a couple of years. And over 4th of July, we saw a couple of bucks in velvet that were four by fours, five by fives. Nice. And they were over by the river eating alfalfa going into this grazing area. And so the goal is to try there. It opens up early for archery. So we're going to try to smack one with a bow. If we can't, then we got to try to get it with a rifle. But mm-hmm. archery would be fun to shoot one of those big old desert bucks with a, with a bow and arrow. And then um, we've got some stuff coming up in Alaska, hopefully, trying to go hunt a moose. And then mm-hmm. it's pretty much heading to Texas and shooting whitetail and exotics and trying to get back to Hawaii to shoot some access. I got yeah. called on that, which you just did. So. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, it was a little foreign, like just knowing that half the deer they shoot there, they just leave. Like that was, uh, and I'm like, dude, I, I, as a Texan, I've never wasted a deer and I don't, it, it was hard to compartment compartmentalize that reality that, Hey, these access deer, they treat the same way that we treat feral hogs. Yeah. So, you know, is it, is it great to eat? Yes, of course. I would, I try to keep a feral hog in the freezer at all times. I can't keep 20 or 30 that I kill every year in there. And so, you know, they get fed to the coyotes. Anybody that thinks that's unethical, sorry about you. We're just going to have to agree to disagree because they're a pest. Farm on, you know, landowners want them gone. They're fun to hunt. Um, you could, uh, like, if we go shoot 20 hogs in a night with thermals between three or four guys, and it's 100 degrees. You know, it's like last night at nine o'clock here, it was 104 degrees. What do they want you to do with those hogs? Yeah. Lo- load them up in my uh, refrigerated 18 wheeler that I don't have and take them somewhere where they can come pick them. It's not realistic. Like, it's just it's, it's stupid, is what it is. Um, but it's, and we also do aerial gunning out of helicopters. You know, those don't get picked up either. Yeah. Um, so, so to, to go to Maui and be like, you guys just shoot here and just leave them here. I was like, that seems insane. He's like, not only do we do that, not my outfitter, but he, in a previous life, uh, before he got into guiding, he was a paid eradicator. Yeah. He would go out at night and shoot as many deer and as many hogs as possible. And you just have to keep in mind, Maui has no native mammal species on the island. So everything's introduced. And the farmers, landowners, don't want them around. They're, uh, they're hell on the native forage and, and oh, yeah. watershed even. Yeah. I, I have a, the two buddies that I have in Maui, they're saying the same thing. They're like, it's such an invasive species and it's, they're like, you probably saw this. I saw this when I was there when you'll see like two to 300 deer come down in a herd mm. and they come down into like the cane fields or they come down into the pineapple plantations. Imagine what a hundred, 200, 300 deer can do to a field in a night. Right. Like, and that's what he was saying too. He goes, dude, just come out. Cause I was like, oh, I just want to come out. I want to shoot a couple to, he's like, yeah, I understand you want to shoot three to take home, but you're shooting 14 to 60 here. If you're coming out, he goes, that's just, what's going to happen. He goes, that's cause he does a lot of the hunting. There's a big uh, cattle ranch out there and they don't run. They don't run the operation on Saturday, Sunday. So he goes in Saturday, Sundays and just, they pay him to go in and kill as many deer as they can. And he can pile them up and leave them. They don't really care. They'll, you know, and the problem is there's no natural predators on. Yeah. And so you, you have scavenging birds and stuff like that, but there's no natural predators. There's so no nothing. Coyotes. Yeah. So nothing's it. So like on the Island of, of Lanai, they say that more access starve than get shot okay. from lack of food on Lanai, which is insane to think about. Uh-huh. Yeah. But that's the reality. Um, so, okay. The moose hunt though, you mentioned, is yeah. that going to be a DIY thing? Yeah, I have a buddy who is in Alaska out of um, Anchorage. No, no, no. We have a buddy. Oh, yeah, yeah. You want to go? <laughs> um, and he's been working on getting his guide license. 
And so in Alaska, it's like a five-year process. And then you have to have so many hours of... What's our new friend's name? I'm just, just curious. <laughs> I can't say that loud on, <laughs> on YouTube. And, um, yeah. But we're trying to get that all set up. We're trying to go in September. Um, oh, and nice. it, it's literally, it's 800 bucks for a, a moose tag. And it's mm -hmm. over the counter. And so it's, you fly into Anchorage, go to his house, gear up, take a puddle plane, you know, into the bush, you're in the bush for five, six days, shoot a moose. And the cool thing, I don't know, a, a lot of people don't know this about Alaska, but you can shoot anything with any tag if it is under the price of what it is. So you shoot, you know, you get an $800 black or moose tag, mm -hmm. but, a, but a caribou is only $550 or a black bear is $300. If you don't tag out a moose, you can shoot a caribou or a black bear under that tag. Oh, I didn't know that. And tag that out as your tagged animal. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a cool thing too. So you go there, you're like, oh, I got 800 bucks for, a, you know, to go shoot a moose, but you don't see a moose the entire time you're there, but you see a giant massive caribou. You can shoot the caribou, tag it with your, ma you, with your moose tag and call it a day. Huh, that's interesting. Which Makes is kind sense. of a cool concept. As long as they've got a handle on the, the populations, which I'm, I'm sure Alaska Fishing Game does. So uh, that's awesome. Um, going back to pronghorn, I think they get a bad rap. And I don't know about Wyoming, but the ones I've shot in Texas have been phenomenal. Keep in mind, they're, they exist more in agricultural settings and not so much in like the sage country. Um, I think antelope meat is some of the best venison on the planet. 100% what uh what's your favorite way to prepare them oh gosh i i usually try to shoot at least two to three a year in wyoming mm -hmm. and then the buddy that i was talking about was an outfitter his family's not big on antelope because they shoot so many elk so they're like whatever mm -hmm. so they usually just if they shoot antelope they just quarter them put them in a put them in the deep freeze and when i get there they're like here's all your antelope meat mm -hmm. so i usually come home with like five or six antelope to me, the best way to do it, um, like I love taking just the backstrap and marinating it, just real simple, Worcester, soy, garlic, rosemary, thyme, salt, pepper, and letting that soak for eight to 12 hours and then taking it out and doing like a reverse sear on your smoker, like on a Traeger or Camp Chef, whatever you have, uh -huh. and then cutting it into like a medium rare. To me, that's where it shines. A lot of people will take, because Antelope meat will dry out a lot more than venison. I mean, there's zero fat on these. Like when you, when you, when you take off the hide, it is just meat and hide. Like there's no fat, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And so you get, you can really dry it out. If you overcook them, if you try to like do a roast, that kind of stuff, they usually don't take too well, but that Mississippi pot roast with antelope is stupid. Good. Mm. If you've ever had, have you ever had Mississippi pot roast? Uh, I don't, that's I, where you take like the, I've had pot roast, roast. but I don't know if I've called it Mississippi. You take like a crock pot, take like a can of like one of those jars of pepperoncinis. Uh -huh. You dump the whole can of pepperoncinis in there with the pepperoncinis and the juice. Then you take uh, a pack of uh, brown gravy mix, like just the au jus brown gravy mix, put it on top. Don't mix anything. Take a patch pack of ranch seasoning, like for, uh -huh. to make your own ranch, pour that over it, and then put a put like half a stick of butter on the top, and just turn it on low and let it go all day long. And all that renders down. You put it on like sandwich rolls dude it's stupid and, and it's one of those you would do this with a shoulder roast or shoulder roast or uh one of your you know top or bottom rounds mm -hmm. any of those tougher cuts that you can just throw that in there and just let it freaking break down so i don't have any antelope in the freezer right now but I i'll do, do it with have, a deer i do have some moose and oh yeah i think uh and the kids love it too because you think about like the pepperoncinis aren't hot yeah. right like they're not there's no heat to them it just adds that kind of that flavor but then you take all that, you put it out onto like a roll, and then you take the rest of that au jus that was down there in that thing, and then I would put it out there. It's great for deer camp because you put it in before you leave, and you, you hunt all day long. You come back, you just you guys just pile up, and then you put little bowls of the au jus, and people just dip mm -hmm. and eat the sandwiches, and it just shreds. All and right, that's apart. happening very soon at the Smith House. I'll send you the recipe. It's, yeah. it's insane. Absolutely. Um, let's do this. Let's take our last break here. We'll come back and we'll talk um, about your Texas, your Texas schedule, some classes. I don't know if they're full or not, but uh, you've got some opportunity there. And then um, Turkey as well, because I think Turkey is a certainly underrated wild game. You probably still have some in the freezer from the spring. I know I do. Yeah, I shot uh, 11. 11? Yeah. Dang, I shot three and I thought I did good, but uh, 11. Okay, 
we'll we'll take that break. We'll come right back. <clears throat> All right. Well, hey man, thanks for sticking around. As, yeah, anytime. Uh, yeah, enjoying the conversation. And you had me on your podcast recently. You you started your own podcast. How many episodes do you have under your belt now? Uh, I just posted the tenth one, so not as many so as you, you, but it's going well. You're doing one a week. I'm trying to do one a week, so I try to okay. post on Wednesdays. Perfect. Right on, man. Um, well, let's talk about Texas and your from field to plate classes, which I'm sure that's probably either in the hill country or South Texas, just based on deer density. Yeah, actually this, I signed a thing with West Texas Outfitters. Mm. Uh, it's two brothers out of Houston, younger guys in their thirties and they run concrete out of Houston, but they have a place down in Comstock. And so that's like West, West Texas, right above mm. Del Rio area. And so they've got a 38,000 acre low fence ranch. And uh, that's where we're going to be doing the classes for the next couple of years, just for the fact of the deer density down there, the population, um, and just the wide open spaces to kind of do more of what we want. And so from the, the from field to play classes are geared towards new or experienced hunters that want to go deeper and dive deeper into it to learn more about the butchering process, the gutting process. There is the shooting aspect of it. So we do go to the shooting range and kind of, if you're uncomfortable on a firearm or uncomfortable on your, your weapon or your weapons, you don't know how to sight in a weapon, bring it down. We're going to go through the whole mechanics and basics of how to do that. And then once the deer are on the ground, that's where the real fun starts is it's all we do a skinning class, a gutting class, an anatomy class. And then you go into the whole butcher breakdown where you process all your meat yourself. So you get a big table, everyone processes. If you want to make sausage, we make sausage. Mm -hmm. You want to make jerky, we, we, we make jerky. I signed a deal with Traeger. So we're going to have Traegers at the class. So if they want to make jerky straight onto the Traeger, we'll smoke, we'll smoke jerky as well as summer sausage and all that good jazz. So it's kind of a fun thing. Plus, I don't know if you saw that thing I invented. Oh, so yeah, I saw the 40, like the uh, prototype here. Isn't that rad? Uh -huh. So the cool thing is, is all the parts come off. Uh -huh. So I can talk about the shoulder blades. I can talk about the rib cages. I can talk about like where the lung sits, the lung falls out, but the heart. So sits he's, the for, for people that are just listening to the radio show or podcast, he's holding a 4D white tail totally. deer buck. Yeah. Which so. completely breaks down. Like you were saying, that's awesome. So, and then I'm going to take those back legs and the front leg that comes off those, and I'm going to actually mold and create different muscle groups. So people can actually sit there and see how the muscles pull apart and see how they sit oh. on there. So, cause there's a lot of people that I teach the classes, even though the deer is there and they have a leg in front of them, they're very uncomfortable with the way that the muscles break apart. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to sculpt each and every muscle. So I can take that front shoulder and be like, Hey, there's two stakes on this side. There's one stake on this back and it'll all be where they all kind of fit in and, you know, 3d molded onto this aspect of it. And there's just that, or, or, or your kid taking your kid out there and showing them the sh proper shot placement. And so like how many deer will someone get to shoot on, on one of those experiences? So it's guaranteed one deer is what they're mm -hmm. shooting. And then usually we're shooting a couple more. Um, there's also hogs out there. So hogs are, we'll, we'll go out, we'll do a night of predator hunting with thermals. We'll hunt hogs. We hunt predators. So we'll, there's a lot of silver Fox out there. We'll hunt like the Fox and there's javelina. We're, we're hunting javelina. So the goal is underrated. It, it's, oh, fair. it's phenomenal. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll do that, but yeah, you come out and it's guaranteed to shoot one deer. Uh, we try mm -hmm. to keep it at shooting a doe first because no one ever argues on the size of a deer. When it's a doe, a doe comes in and hang it up. Everyone's like, oh, you shot a doe. It's never like, oh, your doe was 130 and my doe was 128. Like, right. A doe's a doe. But when you come in and there's a six point and an eight point, sometimes guys will feel, or girls will feel like, oh, I didn't, I, I didn't get the experience they did because I shot a six point, which I, I love a slick six better than an eight point any day. So, hmm. Well, you can't eat the horns, but I definitely would shoot the eight point over the six for me. <laughs> oh, dude, a big old slick six going up? No. Nah. Well, if it, okay, if they're relatively the same, you know. But I'm not talking about like a little, like a little three by three. I'm talking like you get that six, you know, that that five year old, six year old six point, which has, you know, eleven inch, you know, G one, G two, G three sticking out. I think that's just mm -hmm. over like just a typical eight. I don't know. I think that or like a good basket. I love like a good white tail. That's a real, real tight basket. Well, where I hunt a lot of the time, those are illegal to shoot because they're not 13 inches wide. Oh, doubt, yeah. You, you have to have where you are going to be hunting that they have antler restrictions. No. Um, so, um, well, cool. So where can people find uh, 
how to how to enroll in, in one of those yeah classes. The, i'm actually releasing the classes uh, i don't know when you're releasing this episode but on monday so what's the 23rd 24th 25th of july yeah. so next week you'll yeah you'll can... yeah next week they're going to go up for sale um last year the spot sold out in five minutes so uh, we're also going to do a veteran hunt this year. That's going to be completely paid for. That's, that's just going to show up and do it. It's going to be the wounded vets. Um, we've got guys with amputees who have been complaining to me that a lot of ranches won't take them out because they can't, um, they don't feel like they're adequate enough in their vehicles or their housing or whatever. And so we're putting together a whole hunt where these guys will go out. We, we're, we're talking to gun manufacturers with the, uh, with the blow mouths. If the guys don't have arms where they can sit there mm. and actually blow on these guns and control it all and really give them the experience of hunting and butchering and teaching them that even though they don't have arms, they can still butcher and break down these deer. And there's one guy who's double amputee that was showing me different ways with his hook that he can, there's a different attachments and stuff. That he can oh, get wow. into it. And so I think it'll be really exciting for them to really kind of just get out there and, and go. And then we're doing a meet week with these guys where at the end of the season, whatever tags they have left, we just go. And last year we shot 18 deer in two days. Mm. just filled freezers so and, and all of that's right there on your website yep yeah from from field to plate.com it'll all be posted here like i said it's starting on july 25th and it'll mm. all be able to access you you can get your deposit and then pay for it later and you don't have to have it all up front it's pretty cheap too it's only 1800 bucks yeah, for, uh, for a four-day hunt and butcher class so and a, and you get a deer to take home guaranteed a deer to take with home. all that knowledge too yeah very cool um, let's talk turkeys. You said before the break, you shot 11 this year. So where all did you go? Uh, yeah. And then the year before that we shot, I did that, you know, in 2021, we did the, the culinary grand slam with NWTF where we shot I should, like seven States. Uh, that's what all the birds are. If you're looking on video behind me, if not, there's a really cool fan of all five subspecies. And it was, so this year it was California, which you can shoot two. And then we're Texas where you can shoot four. So mm -hmm. there's your six, uh, Washington and then Oregon with my cousin up in Oregon and then, um, doing some other ones down in, um, like Alabama, Mississippi type area. Mm. So I don't know. I love Turkey hunting. And I think that meat is way, way overrated or underrated as well. Yeah. And I know you like the innards too, which my buddy and I, um, we do this hunt in South Texas every year and our guys, Hey, be quiet. And, um, yeah, we do this hunter, this, this hunt in South Texas every year. We take the, the, uh, kidney, the, uh, liver, the heart, and he likes the gizzard. I don't really like the gizzard. I'm not going to lie. I find it really chewy. Yeah. Uh, but we, you know, prep them, mix it all up with a little butter, onion garlic if we have a bell pepper we throw that in there and really important we grab some of the fat from the the turkeys like the stuff that's covering its breast if it's really nice it's like a yellow color throw that in there and it just melts down like better too and uh, eat it out of a bowl or put it on a tortilla Oof, that's some good stuff it's just the uh the nasty bits taco oh dude and yeah you know me it's if it's nasty it's for me mm -hmm. and this year i actually saved the skin from the turkey neck i haven't posted a picture of that yet but you can actually the indians used to use that as sausage casings mm. and so i took um the wing meat so you know you, you, it's really tough wing meat and i ground that up with the with the liver the gizzard uh, the heart and actually the turkey testicles which are up on the top mm. threw all that in there ground it up seasoned it real well and then made a sausage casing out of that and then punctured it and grilled it dude it actually it was, oh, that sounds it was insane because it was, you think about it. What would you, what do you call it? I don't know. Turkey neck sausage. <laughs> um, and the guy, one of the guys we were hunting with, he was a Scotsman and he said it, it reminded him of, you know, all the different Scots meats and eating all the, you know, where they shoot, you know, throw the innards and they stuff it inside stomachs and they're going, he's like, Oh, this reminds me of that. It was just very, very rich. And I, I'd thrown different, very strong spices in there. And it was just one of those deals where once you cooked it and you cut into it like a sausage, we put it with some gravy and some taters. And it was, I don't know, it's, it's the stuff that people just throw away. And so the how much stuff that we did not throw away 150 years ago, no one would have dreamed of throwing oh. anything away. No. And, and even, you know, I was reading a, a book recently for some Native American stuff. And one of them was turkey head soup. Huh. Where they would take the heads of the turkey and throw it in the soup and boil it all down. So all the collagens, all the fats, all the everything else. And they would eat this soup. 
and they'd put root vegetables in the soup. And so this year, my goal is to, this next season is to save all the turkey heads and try to make a turkey head soup because it's not like you're sitting there crunching on the bones and the beak, but it's just like, if you're doing it like a birria where, you know, you're using authentic or you're doing like mm -hmm. a goat head or something like that. It's just pulling all of that extra meat and flavor off of this bird, the brain, all that stuff's going to boil in and add flavor. And then just throwing your, you know, your taters and your carrots and your onions and breaking that down and then using that as just a broth type soup. Think about mm. how much, I mean, it's gotta be good. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, like the easiest thing I think people can do, which like best bang for your buck though, uh, with a turkey breast, which I just got my first like flat top skillet recently, you know, it yeah. goes on the back patio. Oh dude, I love cooking on that griddle. It is awesome. And I just, I've done it twice. Um, now just, a whole turkey breast will feed my family if we just make fajitas out of it. Yeah. Just dice that up, slice it up like fajitas, get all the silver skin off, um, and then, you know, your peppers and onions and just put that on the skillet. That is tough to beat. And then, of course, with the skillet, you just, you know, warm up your tortillas right there. Yeah. If you don't have one, regardless of which brand you choose, I, I would highly recommend getting a, you know, a griddle situation for your back porch. I don't know if you saw that video of last time we were in Texas. And one of the companies um, sent me one of their little tabletop griddles uh -huh. that you plug a propane tank into. And we were out in the middle of nowhere and we found this old like cattle, cattle guard crate, you know, to put them up into, in the stockades. And we just threw that out there, threw wild meat on it, onions, peppers, tortillas, like you're talking about. We made fajitas in the middle of the hunt. All the guys are like, what are we doing? I said, we're eating breakfast. And they're like, <laughs> what? And it's just, but yeah, like you're talking about those, it's simple, stupid stuff that, that is insane. We, we, we turkey hunted in Texas this year and the guy who was running the, the ranch, he was like, Oh, I don't eat Turkey meat. Turkeys are gross. Turkey, you know, cause he's a typical Texan or typical Turkey hunter. who's was just like, Oh, it's overcooked. They've only ever had, he literally only ever had it in poppers. And mm -hmm. then someone tried to like cook it like a Thanksgiving Turkey and dried the sucker out and you know, just doesn't cook like that. And so I made every, every night we were there, I made dinner, you know, I made a bourbon glazed Turkey, like Turkey bites where we sliced up, I did where I threw the legs and the thighs and I did a barbecue, like a pulled barbecue French fry type deal. Mm -hmm. And then I did one where I wrapped, I took the turkey breast, uh, feathered it out real thin, wrapped it with spinach and uh, bacon, garlic, rosemary. What else did I put in there? I did uh, see that one. I cream cheese. One. And then I rolled yeah. it up, tied it and mm -hmm. we grilled it. And I remember the whole time this, he ended up taking leftovers home. He's like, I'm going to take some of this. I'm going to take some of this. And he actually texted me. He's like, Hey, turkey season's coming up. You coming back out <laughs> just for the fact that like now he wants to eat turkey. He's like, dang it. Now I got to go shoot turkey because it just tastes so freaking good. So I pretty, love to make fun. a, um, pozole with the legs. Oh like yeah. Corn or hominy based. Um, I would just call it like a soup or a stew. Yeah. It's got a lot. It's, and it's like, um, green chili based, like the sauce. Uh, and, and most of the ingredients just come out of a can. But my kids absolutely love that. It's a family favorite. And they like that too. They're like, Dad, it's, when are we shooting more turkeys? You know, not them. They haven't shot turkeys. But they're like, when are you shooting more turkeys? We need to eat that pozole thing you made. Yeah, um, I don't know if you saw. I, I posted that picture of the KFC bowls with mm -hmm. the turkey. So I diced the turkey and I made my own. Oh, I did see that, yeah. But like uh -huh. the, it's probably the best turkey nuggets you've ever had. Just Even if you don't want to make the bowl, go on and look at the recipe. I'm from fieldtoplay.com and just follow the recipe. Um to make these turkey nuggets. I've, I've had over 300 people that have written me like, okay, that's just the nugget I'm going to make. But I made those KFC bowls because my wife's like, I really want KFC bowls, but they're really bad for you. Right. I was like, oh, I can make them. Pulled out a turkey breast, you know, diced them up, got the mashed potatoes. And then I took a couple of the, I always save all the bones and stuff and the legs even after I make whatever and made a broth and then made gravy with it. And dude, it was, it's stupid when your kids are sitting there going, this is good. I'm yeah. like, yeah, this is real good. And not bad, not as bad for you as like KFC. Uh, I made a, I think I did it with elk, but you could use any venison. Like, and this sounds so gross, but I, I like the Taco Bell Crunchwrap Supreme. I don't eat them anymore, uh, but I'm, you can make them at home. With That's the one that's all uh, folded in on itself? Oh, like, yeah, a, like, like a quesadilla inside of a uh -huh, taco or yeah. a taco inside of a quesadilla? I've never, I've take, never had one. You're missing out. But yeah, just take your whatever... Uh, ground venison you want and it's not hard just look on taco bell's website or if you've had a crunch wrap supreme you no know what's yeah in no it. i've never because remember i can't eat beef so a lot of places i don't go 
and yeah. try stuff. Cause like Taco Bell, what do you get a bean burrito for me? Uh-huh. Um, but even then I think they, Wait, use, I didn't like, know you can't eat. Oh, I didn't know that. That's what, how you yeah. got into this whole thing. I'm like, duh. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm, you yeah, told I'm, me that a long time ago. I did. Yeah, I'm allergic to beef. Yeah, yeah. So that's my, and it's funny cause you know, that company Everly well, uh-huh. you've heard of them. They're the ones that do all the testing for everything. Right. Mm-hmm. They actually reached out to me on Instagram. We're like, Hey, so we heard a lot of times that you're allergic to a lot of things, a lot of oils, fats, but you, you know, you live more of this organic lifestyle. Can we send you a test to take? We have a new test with tests like over 300 food items. Huh. And so I took it and it was funny because I was looking at the rarest ones and the rarest one was like beef and mine's like 100%. And I was like, <laughs> well, there you go. One of their tests come back and it says, you know, it's like the zero 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 point one percent of the population is allergic to beef. And it's like, uh, well, I guess. I forgot. That's how we got here. That's how we got. That's uh, how we got from the plate. plate. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, last thing, because I was just I in Mexico use- for the, uh, the wife's 40th birthday. Yeah. And. I was taking video of these things. They look like a cross between a raccoon and a monkey. They've got this long, straight tail like a monkey. But basically, you would look at it and be like, that looks like something to be in the raccoon family. It turns out that they are in yeah. uh, the same family as ringtails. And uh, it's called a Cotamundi. A Cotamundi. A Cotamundi? Cotamundi. Cotamundi. Okay. Um, and we actually have them in the United States, even yeah, as Texas far and New Mexico. east as Texas. And Arizona, I've seen people shoot them in the desert. Yep. in arizona yep. um but it just shows you how diverse their habitat is because they can live in the desert of arizona but really i think like the the part where they're probably the most prolific is in the jungles of yeah. most of mexico and so we're seeing these things around the resort they let you they're pretty desensitized to humans obviously in a place like that but i was just you could see them day and night just running around take videos take pictures and i posted on instagram and you're like dude, those things are delicious. And I was like, well, this is the first time I've ever even seen one in person. I've never obviously eaten one. And so w- where did you eat one of these things and what was it like? Yeah, so we were hunting uh, oscillated turkey down in the Yucatan jungles of Mexico. Mm-hmm. So near Cancun, probably close to where you guys yeah, that's were. that's where I was. Yeah. Um, and so they're primarily going to be in that location. That's why we see them coming up through the Mexico Peninsula. And you'll see them in parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And we were hunting turkey in we see these and they're telling us like, Oh, if you want to shoot this, if you want to shoot this, you want to shoot like a crested curacao, if you want to shoot whatever. And so a Kawada Mundi came out and we were like, what is that? Sort of like you, like, is that a raccoon? Is that a monkey? Is that an mm. anteater? Cause they got really long snouts. Right. And you look in their mouth and their teeth are like ridiculous teeth. Like it looks like you're looking in the mouth of like a Wolverine. Yeah. And, and so our little Mayan guide was like, Oh, very delicious. Very delicious. Very delicious. Very delicious. It's like, all I need to hear. Boom. And so we were, we're back at camp and we're chit chatting with the outfitters and he's like, dude, shoot one. I was like, I don't want to pay it 800 bucks to shoot one of these things. He goes, not just freaking shoot one. We'll eat it. I was like, so we go out and the guy that I'm filming, he ended up shooting one because it came out to the watering hole. Cause you know, you think of watering holes in Texas are huge. You go to a watering hole in the Yucatan jungle. It's literally the size of like a coffee cup mm. that just naturally fills with water. And these, every critter from everywhere comes to drink this, I mean, out of this water. And this thing comes in, he drops it, we bring it back, and the little Mayans go nuts, dude. They're like jumping, they're hooting, hollering, they're grabbing this thing. And so I told this guy, I'm like, hey, it's not for a trophy, right? It's like, no, no, you guys can do it. Do whatever you want with it. Because, you know, a lot of these guys want it to mount it all cool on a tree mm-hmm. or something like that. And so this little Mayan dude um, starts, without even talking, starts to build this giant, I told him, I said, cook it how you cook it, not how you want to cook it for us. Like yeah. how your culture cooks it, how your ethnicity cooks it. I want to see how a traditional Mayan would cook a Kawatamundi. And so he starts to build this big old giant fire. I'm like, all right, cool. He's going to grill it, right? He takes that sucker. It's, they've got about two inch long hair. Takes the whole thing, throws it on the fire. Hmm. Takes it off, starts scraping off the hair. Throws it back on, scrapes off the hair. Pulled, until it looks like a hog, right? And he's mm-hmm. using the tail as the means to get it on off the fire. Gets the whole thing down with all the hair. Then he guts it takes out all the guts and he kind of like spatchcocks it, kind of cracks it open with the ribs a little bit. And thing is already looking gorgeous. Then he starts digging a hole, puts all the coals from the fire down there, wraps this thing in banana leaves, throws on the fire and he goes, okay, five hours. Mm. Walks away. And so we go do other stuff. We go kind of, we go hunt again. We come back and he's like, okay, we start to unbury this thing. And he pulls it out and the fat looks like 
just it, the whole skin looks like a like a cooked hog. Mm-hmm. And he starts to peel the skin off. He gives me a thing of it. The skin was really chewy, and it was very very salty. He didn't put one ounce of seasoning on this thing. Takes okay. off the skin, starts to just shred the meat like like pulled pork. And he takes he made homemade fresh tortillas, so corn tortillas. And he t- he made a homemade pico de gallo, and he took a taco shell hot put the shredded meat on there, put the pico de gallo on it and handed it to you. And you took a bite of it and it melted like butter. And it was one of those deals where there was other guys at camp who were hunters, but not like adventurous eaters like myself and the guy I was with. They're going back for like seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, till this whole, and then so like the legs and stuff and you go look and in the kitchen, the Mayans are just sitting there eating like a, like a turkey leg at the <laughs> fair. And they're like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So the next day they're like, oh, shoot another one. We're like, well, no, we're looking at like, um, but it's one of those deals that after we all sat around the table, there's like 10 of us, we all agreed that we would go and hunt these for the meat mm. specifically. Just, it was that good and that tender. And it really, it makes me excited to think the fact that like, how could I cook it? Like their cooking was phenomenal, but like think about just a little bit of spice or a little bit of seasoning to this thing, mm. how much more elevated it could be. But again, I would cook it the way they cooked it day in and day, day out and live off of this freak. And the tail meat too was, it's like gator tail, just, beautiful yeah some things get a so some things like that you wouldn't think to eat and then you go experience it in a foreign place with a foreign people and your eyes are open uh i think a lot of people in texas feel that way about javelina like uh, we're not eating that it's, we call them stink pigs for a reason they're gross no one's eating. yeah we did at my buddy's ranch um where henry shot his first buck this year we did a venison neck roast Mm-hmm. and a javelina uh and these, i don't maybe they weren't roast but slow cooked for like eight hours each of them and then we made tacos kind of the same thing pico you know the, the deal there was no javelina left everyone knew what it was some of them were even grossed out by the idea then they started eating it it was like oh my gosh this is so good there were still plenty of venison neck roast but no javelina because everyone was like god the javelina is better than the than the deer and i've been preaching that for how long Mm-hmm. And it's all about, it's about how you process it and getting it and, you know, make sure you don't touch that gland on the back and make it, there's, there's ways to go about it. But every person I've cooked javelina for in Texas is like, dang it. Now I got to keep them. Mm-hmm. And I remember even in Argentina, we were hunting dove in Argentina and one of the guys had uh, brought, you know, javelina and he slow cooked both of the rear legs in red wine, just red wine and like garlic, I think was in there. Mm-hmm. And in a big cast iron pot, just kept twisting till it fell apart. And then he just put it over just plain rice, dude. And then poured the, that wine reduction on top. It was insane. And mm. it's, it's funny how simple, stupid food can be and how us, we try to like overanalyze and over dissect it when it's just think about what our forefathers and ancestors were eating. They weren't making hamburger helper out of it. Mm-hmm. They weren't just throwing it on an open fire. They were slow cooking things that they knew. It was sort of like you with, with Bobcat. You're like, ah, it was, it was gross. And I'm like, well, yeah, I thought I told you. It's because you threw it on the freaking grill like an idiot, right? Mm. And it's, that's not what they were doing. They understood the process. And once you understand how the meat works, everything is edible and everything is delicious once you understand the process. It's not like you're going to take an Audad leg and sit there like, oh, it's delicious. Taking Audad and cooking it like Pakistani or Middle Eastern style food, which they eat all that old, their spices are meant to cover that old nasty goat and sheep taste. Mm-hmm. So taking an Audad, cooking it that way as a Pakistan or a Middle Eastern or Indian style food, it's insane. It's incredible because you're looking at the cultures that are utilizing that t- style of meat and understanding like, hey, it's not just making chili, but it's maybe we're making a really deep curry for our meal or a butter mm-hmm. style curry for this meal. Yeah, I, uh, I've eaten three cats. And I would have to rank Bobcat as the worst of Lynx. Lynx was pretty good. I had in Canada. We made Lynx low main and then mountain lion the best. Very good. That Bobcat. But to be fair, we did, we did it on purpose. We were like, let's get, let's taste what a Bobcat tastes like. Blah. Not good. When you just throw it on the grill with no seasoning. No, no. We were just like, that was, that was rough. Yeah. Uh, It tastes, well, it kind of has that cat urine taste to it which you could taste in the yeah. back straps without yeah. any, you know, any prep. 
so we didn't put any effort into it and we were not rewarded <laughs> for the <laughs> lack of effort. Stupid as um, stupid does. Well, hey man, we're uh we're about out of time for today. Again, the website from field to plate.com, new podcast. Y'all check that out as well. Uh always great catching up, my friend. And yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I hope that you have a great fall. Yeah, same to you. And hopefully uh, we'll get you out and we'll be able to actually hunt together one of these days because I'm there a ton. We're, we're going to try to do turkey hunt this year and just didn't pan out, but it yeah. happen. Well, sounds like a plan. Talk to you later, buddy.